Matthias van der Meent. Uh, I started hacking on Postgres in September 2020. Uh, initially, a uh, performance fix, which was incorrect. Uh, but after that, I did some uh, bug fixes. Uh, there was a slight issue in the uh, performance improvement that I did. I'm still working on that. I'm hoping it gets committed eventually, um, but can't promise anything. Uh, hoping for 17 still, but probably 18 or later. Um, but yeah, the first bugs, bug fixes were committed in September 2020. Uh, later in uh, 21, I got uh, hired by Neon. Uh, due to my performance work on Postgres uh, that was noticed by one of their hackers. Uh, and now I'm a full-time uh, PostgreSQL developer uh, and hacker. Um, I uh, help people out with uh, performance questions as well uh, on the Slack, uh, the community Slack uh, channel. Um, about Neon, uh, they hired me. Um, the ID was a, a developer-friendly PostgreSQL uh, service, like Aurora, but then fully open source. Um, so far, we've been managing decently well. There are some issues which I'll uh, go into uh, detail further later. Um, but the main features that we currently have are instant database clones. Uh, which allows you to test your migrations against essentially your production data set uh, so that you know that there are going to be issues with, for instance, unique constraints that don't actually validate and that kind of stuff without impacting the performance of your production database. Um, we currently also offer scale to zero um, so that, your data, that you don't pay for your database being online all the time if you have a lot of develop development databases. Um, and uh, auto-scaling your database resources based on usage so that if you know you have a spiky, uh, uh, spiky workload, then you will also uh, only have spiky uh, uh, payments instead of having to pay the maximum performance uh, that you require for all of the time that your database is online, rather than, well, only pay what you use. Um, these are the sections that I'll be talking about. Um, mostly PostgreSQL has a high uh, has a dependency on disk, uh, quite a hard dependency. But we want to stop that because if you're um, scaling databases to zero, then you also essentially lose access to your disk, or you have to uh, attach disks again and again, and that can take a long time, especially in a cloud environment. Um, so um, I'll be talking about. Um, how we manage uh, and how we ch uh, get what kind of challenges we have when uh, trying to remove the local file system dependency for um, permanent storage. And these are the uh, se uh, segments that I specifically identified that have been problematic for us. First of all, the disk dependency. PostgreSQL uses the disk for various sections. Uh, the main item that you get is the data directory. Uh, PostgreSQL installations are in one of, uh, are usually in one directory for the main data. And then there are also um, metadata sections in the, in the data directory. But there's also um, external file, um, directories for the shared uh, data, like the p main PostgreSQL binary and the extensions. And, uh, well, uh, those are uh, basically the uh, things that you have to take into account. Um, then, how PostgreSQL uh, manages data. Um, for persistence, it mainly uses wall, uh, write ahead log. Uh, it contains the changes of what am I going to change, uh, where is it going to change, and once it's written to disk, uh, it is considered that the change is uh, permanent. This is also how commits work. Um, you wait until the wall is off, uh, which contains the commit record of, hey, I committed these changes. Uh, when it, once it's written to disk, um, the server can uh, return to the user that, hey, yes, this commit it has, been commit has actually been committed by the database. You will start seeing the changes in other sessions as well. Um, the long term, because wall is, 
only in one dimension. It is really difficult to query the changes itself. Uh, this is why the changes uh, that you've made are also written in the normal pages uh, and written to disk so that old wall can be deleted because the change basically the change log of your database can get quite large, um, terabytes and terabytes in size. You really don't want to keep all that around. So um, you also write the, the um, pages themselves to disk, eventually from the buffers to the disk. Um, and that's how the main persistent model of PostgreSQL is, uh, works. However, um, the wall is a change log for most things, uh, but it is also optimized for the PostgreSQL workflow, uh, which means it doesn't contain the command ID, it doesn't contain visibility hint bits um, in the normal records. Uh, and there are many other such cases where there are uh, slight inconsistencies between what is actually lo what is contained in the wall records and what is written to disk. But, uh, PostgreSQL gets away with this because uh, command IDs are only used within a transaction. And if PostgreSQL crashes, um, we don't care about the internals of a transaction anymore because every transaction that was live uh, will be rolled back. So we don't care about that command ID. And if it has been committed, then no one will ever look at the internal uh, state of the transaction again anyway. Um, so we don't care about that command ID. Um, also, visibility hint bits. Um, the, um, when working with a replica, the visibility of things may be different from the primary node because a transaction may not be visible anymore at the secondary. Uh, well, may not be visible uh, to any transaction on the primary, but in the secondary it might still be uh, used by some transaction over there. So they are not always contained. Uh, so the visibility hint bits uh, are quite likely not contained in the wall record themselves. Uh, only for full page visibilities, this is different. Um, but for, spe uh, for a specific record, uh, with a specific, uh, say, your table uh, record entry with uh, ID 20, uh, when it's changed, the visibility hint bits are not included. Um, so these are, uh, this is specifically um, problematic for our use case because um, uh, I'll come back to that uh, in the next slide. So the main benefits of the Postgres uh, data model when using a local disk is that the, once you have written the data to disk uh, using the normal file system uh, and um, storage manager API, you don't need wall redo uh, on recovery or basically any time anymore once it's written. Uh, but you need a large file system uh, when you have a lot of data. Um, if you lose your disk, lose access to your uh, file system, that's data loss. Uh, and write amplification is quite significant because you write bo the changes both in the wall and you write your changes back to disk once um, you are going uh, once you checkpoint your data so that you don't have so that you can get rid of the old wall so there is a wall uh, write amplification there which is which can be quite significant in neon we only we get rid of the write back of the normal uh, storage manager um, we only use wall for persistence um, how we manage this is uh, we consume the wall immediately uh, at our um, well uh, safe keepers um, and we process that and make sure that the data becomes available to uh, Postgres um, through our own storage manager API um, which will manage the um, well main relation data um, but because we use the wall um, we also have to modify the postcast uh, the uh, we also have to modify and use the um, uh, wall records used within PostgreSQL because PostgreSQL itself uh, uses uh, the heap uh, redo manager which manages how to um, store and uh, log the changes to uh, the normal Postgres tables. Uh, it doesn't have the command ID as I mentioned earlier. We 
had to modify Postgres to use our own uh, redo manager, which has the specific uh, information as well, like the command ID and visibility hint bits. And we intercept some writes to the uh, some writes which would usually go to disk uh, to also wall log some changes. Uh, for instance, for the visibility map and the free space map, I think as well, uh, so that we don't lose all of the data. Um, but it increases some. Um, uh, it does increase the uh, wall volume that we use. As I mentioned, um, we persist the wall uh, through safekeepers. We use uh, Paxos Quorum for that. Uh, that means that we have three safekeepers. Uh, which all need to be up to date to some point in the wall and uh, have acknowledged that the wall exists uh, up to that point, and then we can uh, we can consider that it is uh, persisted. This is not much different different from a uh, physical replication in PostgreSQL itself, um, using three replication replicas. Uh, except that in this case, they are not PostgreSQL nodes, but they are our own safekeeper nodes, and they um, internally persist the data without actually having to process a lot of that. It's just storing the, uh, just storing it. Um, later, the wall is processed and indexed by the page server and persists to it S3, so that we can serve the uh, read request from the PostgreSQL node because we don't have actual. Um, the normal PostgreSQL files. Um, we need to, uh, but we do need to have access to the pages, so we have this. The main benefit of this being that we can actually clone the data and in any point in time, and uh, all of the main benefits that the post that Neon's uh, inf uh, structure needs uh, wants to achieve. Uh, this is how we ach uh, achieve that. Then, some issues with uh, streaming application. In normal PostgreSQL, uh, you apply all the changes you get if you get a wall record uh, during streaming replication. Um, so, as a read-only replica or um, or as a hot standby, you get the wall record. You look at hey, which pages do I need to uh, uh, Does it contain which change? Which changes do I need to apply? And what PostgreSQL does is it gets the page if it doesn't exist or if it doesn't already have it in memory, it reads it back from the disk. Um, in Neon, that would be quite expensive because every time we get a page, um, we get it at a point in time considering uh, the replay state of uh, the rest of the system. But we can get it at any point in time, even uh, and assuming that the wall exists, we can get it at the point in time after that wall record. So, if we're at a read replica and we need to get the page from disk, well, disk, um, we can also just get it from the page server at a newer point in time. So, if we're going to get it f uh, at the time before the wall record exists and then replay the wall record at the replica, it's quite wasteful because we can just ignore the changes as well, just as well. So that's what we do. Uh, this saves us time and effort uh, redoing the re um, replaying wall. Uh, but it is something to, t uh, to take special care because it is also possible that a concurrent backend um, was reading ahead and was thinking, hey, I'm going to need that page at some point in time. And we only have changes up to, uh, say, five minutes ago. So. I'm going to request that page, and it could be that it just hasn't yet processed the page and put it into memory, um, which means that the page that this has requested is older than the page that the uh, current system thinks it should be. Uh, so while we only p uh, apply changes to cached pages, we also need to take care that we don't uh, accidentally uh, put pages in the caches of memory, um, which were read ahead, which were read ahead at the earlier version, uh, and now contain uh, well are missing changes. Um, so, yeah, we do have to do some uh, tricks there to make sure that we don't accidentally lose changes in the read replicas. This is uh, usually fine. 
There's also some issues in Postgres uh, with um, other files. Uh, for instance, the replica, uh, replica slot changes, these are unlocked. So from the wall perspective, we don't actually know this state, which means that if we shut down the uh, PostgreSQL node and we start up a new one um, using the same wall, we don't have access to the replication slot state which is kind of an issue if you're trying to make something that also has access to replication slots. Same with PG Logical, it stores a lot of state uh, for logical replication, but this too is not designed for ephemeral use. You can't just drop it and, cons and think everything will work fine. Um, snapshots and mapping specifically, they are quite, while well, the mappings data uh, can realistically just be lost without issues as long as you don't uh, use um, the wall in between uh, while those mappings existed. Uh, for snapshots, it can be quite a lot uh, different. So our current solution for that is uh, to just wall log the files anyway. Um, it is not efficient, but it works. Um, but it does have the uh, quite a, quite big issues in my opinion, uh, that a lot of wall ex additional wall is generated, and that increases commit latency because m creating more wall means more wall needs to be synced before your commit is ready uh, and confirmed by the safekeepers. And it also creates a feedback loop where replication creates new wall, which needs to be confirmed, which generates more wall because confirming it generates wall, which you need to confirm. So a future solution, which we're currently um, working on a good design, is to directly use a more persistent system, uh, which is not the PostgreSQL wall. Uh, so for instance, as for your network file system uh, like AWS's EFS, I think, uh, or another SAN or another database which does handle uh, Quorum uh, which has its own uh, quorums and can uh, acknowledge that files are written in a distributed manner without actually losing them, uh, lose with no chance of losing the data in any, without losing more data than we would in the same situations. For instance, your, our own systems can't, uh, could technically lose data if three, uh, if out of uh, the three availability zones that we use, uh, two are offline, that's uh, how Paxos works in this case. Um, we wouldn't want to lose any of this information, any of these data um, in cases where we wouldn't also lose other data. So this must be at least as persistent. Um, the main benefit of using this other sol a future solution uh, which uses, uh, which directly communicates with these systems is that it would um, not, uh, not increase the wall usage that we currently see. Then there's also other issues like the statistics files. Um, quite a lot of statistics files are uh, unlocked, like the uh, cumulative uh, statistics systems of the PGSTATL tables and that kind of stuff. The PGSTAT statements as well, it's also unlocked. Um, you don't want to lock that because your queries would be quite a bit slower at that point in time, and you can't actually use this. Uh, you, in that case, you also couldn't actually use uh, the um, these statistic systems in the replica nodes because in a replica node you can't write additional wall. So this would become an issue on replica nodes where if you wanted to uh, log these files, it's just not possible. Um, but these are quite important because, for instance, every one. Uh, Almost everyone uses uh, the PGSTAT statements extension for seeing what kind of queries are running on my si uh, in my cluster. And a lot of people also use the cumulative statistics system to get the statistics of uh, when do I need to um, uh, re-index my uh, indexes or um, how many uh, dead rows are in my table. So it also triggers vacuum. And currently, we don't actually persist the, um, the cumulative statistics or actually any statistics files at all, which means that the vacuum 
will trigger correctly uh, while your node is uh, online, but if your node is shut down, um, you lose the statistics data, which means that the next time your system starts up, it's uh, a vacuum starts with assumptions of there is nothing happened since the last time, and as the last time is an empty table. So vacuum doesn't run anymore, which is quite a problem for us, because, well, and our users, because vacuum is quite important for uh, the Postgres uh, multi-versioning system. Uh, if you don't have vacuum, then suddenly your tables grow incredibly large, uh, and that. So yeah, while the systems, uh, the statistic systems are designed to be uh, lost on crash because they are not persistently stored, um, we crash all the time, and that can be quite problematic. But the future solution, uh, this will be uh, shared with the uh, replication solutions, is to write this all to a persistent file storage or S3 or some other system that can uh, handle this across uh, fail uh, failures in a single availability zone. Then there's another one. Um, right now, um, how our uh, PostgreSQL starts is we uh, retrieve a very minimal uh, PG base backup, which contains this SLUs and some basic catalogs. But the SLUs can be quite large. And dumping such a base backup and rest uh, storing it on disk can be quite significant because the size of the SLU use can be several gigabytes in size. Sure, that can that is usually a uh, very uh, unusual case. It's quite unusual that they are that large, but it's not that uncommon, and it can uh, significantly increase uh, the cold start latency. Um, so what we've recently implemented is on-demand uh, loading of segments, where if we know it should be there, uh, but we haven't loaded it yet, uh, we um, uh, download it on-demand from the page server, uh, which uh, lowers the cold start latency. It does increase the latency of some um, uh, queries a bit uh, while we're still in the warm-up phase, but usually that is not that large of an issue, and uh, users greatly prefer this solution over the solution where they have to wait several uh, hundreds of milliseconds up to actual seconds uh, to start up their database and, um, well, start querying. Because in this case, you can actually start querying and get recent data fairly quickly. Um, yeah. Then there's also um, the issue, uh, well, the issue, uh, an issue with extensions, uh, because, well, it's quite easy to add extensions to your PostgreSQL node, you just install it, but they have to be stored somewhere. Um, we use Docker and Kubernetes quite extensively, um, so we have a Docker uh, image per uh, PostgreSQL version, but, once you've accounted for all extensions, um, the size of such an image is quite large. Uh, 1.2 gigabytes has been uh, reached at least. Uh, it's it was quite large. Uh, so we did some working on that. We got it uh, back down below a gigabyte. But even then, every time you roll out a new version of the system, uh, every time we rolled out a new version of the system, we had to download 1.2 gigabytes before uh, the um, before we had, before we could start the PostgreSQL node, and that's quite expensive because even at the current uh, performance of uh, five gigabits per, se uh, per second per connection, um, 1.2 gigabytes would just take something like one and a half seconds, and that that's not acceptable for our users because if you scale to zero, you also want to scale up back uh, within. Best case, uh, 100, only 100 milliseconds rather than seconds, because while we are uh, starting Postgres, a user is probably waiting. Um, so, what we did, uh, th this was quite easy to bundle new extensions, but the image size is just 
not acceptable. And every time a user wants to add a new extension, uh, the load time increases. And that's just, that doesn't scale, especially when you start uh, considering that multiple versions of extensions, people have already installed all their extensions. So now you have to start uh, checking, hey, do these, can I actually load more than one version of the extension at the same time? It doesn't work well. So what we have currently implemented, it's still in beta, and we still bundle basically all the old extensions from the old version, uh, the old way of doing, they are still bundled in the Docker image. But what we've done uh, for now is um, uh, the new extensions uh, can be loaded on demand using packages in our own proprietary format for now. Um, we are working, uh, we're looking to improve that, but um, developer time is sparse. Um, what we've uh, added is a hook in the load path. If we don't find the file that is referenced in, uh, on the file system, uh, then we uh, load it using the sidecar uh, process that manages the Postgres process uh, for our uh, nodes. And um, it aggressively preloads the extension files for uh, the various libraries that are uh, included for that customer-specific PostgreSQL project. So in this case, uh, we first preload the shared preload libraries because that those are required to start a Postgres and the, po uh, the Postmaster. So before PostgreSQL can actually start accepting um, extensions, uh, it needs to load all the shared preload libraries. Um, so those need to be prioritized most. Um, and after that, it uh, starts loading the session preload libraries and the local preload libraries, uh, each of which are loaded into uh, the um, uh, uh, into the session's backend once the session has connected. And lastly, it uh, loads whatever uh, extensions are further uh, required by the PostgreSQL instance. So they are not preloaded uh, to the session, uh, but they can be accessed. Um, usually, this is, uh, these are extensions like PostGIS and, um, well, other uh, PLV8, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, if there are any questions um, or things that I have not been uh, extremely clear about, then uh, feel free to ask away. You again. Uh, thank you. Uh, can you, uh, if you could just explain exactly how the wall log replication works again. So it looked like you have regular wall log, but you also send stuff over Paxos. Is that right? No. I was just, I was slightly struggling at that point. Paxos is a, an algorithm uh, to confirm uh, logs, basically. And we use the Paxos algorithm uh, on top of PostgreSQL's uh, wall log confirm uh, mechanisms to make sure that the wall is persistent. Um, there is no specific uh, basic implementation of Paxos, but it describes the algorithm uh, on how to, uh, um, when is something considered confirmed, uh, and we use the Paxos uh, confirmation uh, alg algorithm to make sure that we only uh, release a commit uh, back a committing backend once all the wall is confirmed by all the backends. This is not specifically different from uh, Postgres own system, but we gave uh, we uh, confirmed that it confirms with uh, Paxos, which means that we can uh, utilize the guarantees that Paxos brings us. Okay, Does thank that you. Explain it. Uh, it. It gives me a lot more information. This is. Okay. I'm not a low-level uh, uh, guy. Okay. I'm more sort of application. So, but very good. Yes. Thanks. If I understood you right, uh, the benefit is that you now have a stateless Postgres that plays well with containers and everything. But then you have the page server that has the state, so haven't you just uh, deferred the problem to something else, and now you have the same problem all over again? What's the big win? Um, the main benefit is that the page server is 
a um, sm very smart cache on top of S3. You can't really run PostgreSQL on top of S3 because the S3 S3's latencies are terrible uh, for a database. Uh, but using PageServer as a smart cache on top of S3, uh, you can get way better performance while your uh, deep storage costs are, well, long-term storage costs are just way lower than you would get when using a normal file system. Yes? Okay. Uh, I'm on my way. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Uh, is the page server using table access method or are you using something else? Excuse me, again? A table access method is the interface to swap the no. storage? Uh, no. As I think I uh, put into one of the slides. Um, yes. Uh, PostgreSQL itself uses uh, the storage manager, has a storage manager API internally, which it uses uh, to interface with uh, the um, uh, data files, uh, which, are eight kilobyte, which uses 8 kilobyte blocks. Uh, we implement the same uh, storage manager API for our page server. So this is below the table access manager. Uh, basically, and we can handle basically any extension as long as they ha use the same uh, storage manager APIs uh, as PostgreSQL itself does. Uh, which means we are compatible with um, the table access methods of, for instance, columnar. And um, if I recall correctly, assuming that they are a table access method, I think timescale as well. Um, but there are various indexing um, extensions like PGRunga, uh, which don't actually use the Disk Storage Manager API, but directly interface with file systems as, uh, instead. And we can't handle those because uh, we can't intercept those file system calls. It's, it's a trade-off, and we've made the uh, consideration and thought, yeah, <laughs> interfacing those, uh, intercepting those is too much of a hassle. Yes. Yeah, just wanted to say I saw one more hand raised here. Uh, maybe I'm missing something, but a question about large image. Uh, you were saying you're trying to reduce the amount of this, the size of the image you're preparing and so on for the extensions. But what about, just maybe it's so stupid, but about the pre-cached images that we, Kubernetes usually pre-caches those images and they're existing on the node and you can easily immediately start using I'm them sorry, and so on. I'm sorry, could you speak up a bit? <laughs> okay, yes. I can try. Yes, much better. So, large image, 1.2 1 gigabyte. Uh, doesn't a image a pre-caching solve this problem for you? Or? Yes, that does. Um, but it is still quite a large image that needs to be distributed. And if we eventually want to give uh, customers the option to also uh, bring their own extensions, we can't include that in the images because, um, well, we could, but that would uh, break pre-caching uh, significantly uh, because we can't just assume that every customer is fine with the extension being available to every customer. So we would have to have a different image for every customer with their extensions. Uh, and that would mean that we couldn't use pre-pooling like uh, you said, or pre-loading like you said. Uh, right now we uh, save something like uh, half a second by uh, pre-starting the image already and uh, pre-loading basically everything we can without um, uh, without actual the specific customer uh, specific information uh, like the actual data or um, the base backup but everything uh, ahead of the base backup has already been started by the time uh, a user starts to connect even um, so that saves us a lot of time if we wanted to bake customer images we would have a pool per customer image and that's not economical Okay, um, a question related to Lauren's question. One of the advantages, and please confirm, this is my question. Yes. Wouldn't it also be that it is very easy to fork now an instance? Like you have all the data there and then you just want to kind of fork it and then start writing different data and you uh, Basically, that's one of the uh, other benefits, yes. Um, because we have indexed the wall and we can, 
we can basically say, hey, I want to start a PostgreSQL instance starting at this point in time. Um, and it doesn't really take a lot of time to restore to that point in time because it's already indexed to uh, at uh, timelines. We have this feature, I think, enabled as well, that you can do point in time queries um, on basically a, a fresh instance every time you want to say, hey, I want to check, was it, uh, did I go wrong, uh, say, yesterday or the day before, or was it at 10 o'clock or was it at 12 o'clock? Um, you can easily do a uh, bisection like that. Yes. One more question? Maybe two. Um, you mentioned that you are allowing customer users to upload their own extension. How do you manage the security of this? Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, right now, it is based on an ex uh, well external repository where we uh, vet the extensions and build them to uh, link to our, uh, our version of PostgreSQL. And uh, by using that, we check that the uh, security is good enough. Um, on top of that, um, the PostgreSQL instances that we run are uh, virtualized within uh, actual virtual machines, not just C groups. So uh, we have several layers of security uh, around the PostgreSQL system, so that even if the PostgreSQL system itself uh, gets compromised by the extension that the user provided, uh, the rest of our uh, uh, hosting doesn't get compromised by that as well. All right, let's go to lunch. Thank you, Matthias. Yes.